coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. It's way past time to turn off universal plug and play. We'll tell you about the new exploit that only takes a single network packet to take advantage of it. Plus how we have our VMware storage set up, some awesome network performance monitoring tools, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 95 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on January 31st, 2013. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible scaleengine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher from his new house, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. To episode 95. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. And in fact, uh, to celebrate episode 100, we have a special announcement coming up in the feedback section of the show. So stay tuned for that because we need your vote. Yes. We, we need do. your vote. Big show today, Alan. Big show. I was uh, joking on the uh, live stream pre show that uh, our roundup this week is as big as some other podcast's entire show. Yep. And I'm not trying to brag, but literally, we have a yeah. huge show today. I don't know how this keeps happening. You were moving. Shouldn't you have been like too busy to do a show? I don't know. Yeah, well, you should have seen what my bookmarks look like. The amount of stuff that is only in the roundup because I didn't have time to well, yeah. do it all. Or, in fact, and the number of things that didn't even make it in the show at all. The, the other thing that's kind of funny is last night, 16 hours ago, you were, while we were doing the faux show, you were wiring the very Ethernet jack <laughs> that you're yes. plugged into right now <laughs> to do the show. Yes. So uh, on Tuesday, <laughs> the, the electricians finished. Uh, putting all the ethernet drops around my house but they don't terminate them right they they run it to a, a an electrical box and then i had to put the face do the keystone jack put the face plate on and they all terminate downstairs where i, I bought a big um, a punch down block and everything but yeah i did you know i'm wearing all the cables while listening to the faux show trying to uh get a, a hard line ethernet to my modem so that uh <laughs> i wouldn't have to use wireless to do the podcast well I'm glad you were listening because we had fun last night. It was a good show. Uh, right. So should we jump into our first news story this week? And this one affects anybody that's really bought a router that has universal plug and play on it, right? Uh, it's, it's usually not the routers that are actually vulnerable. It's all the other devices, but yes. Okay. Tell They're, me about it. Maybe both, actually. Right, so. so universal plug and play is a networking protocol that allows consumer devices like your home routers, printers, media servers, IP cameras, smart TVs, your Xbox and your PlayStation, home automation systems, network storage devices like NASes, your things like Roku, all that stuff to communicate and discover each other. So, for example, if you have a, a NAS that's UPnP enabled and you have a PlayStation or an Xbox, the Xbox sees the NAS and can play the videos off of it on your TV. Sure. And a bunch of things like that. Or, you know, your computer can host the videos and play them on your PlayStation, all that. It's uh, all you can Another do. random example, Windows Home Server. I did, a, I did a long time ago, I did an in-depth look on Windows Home Server, and one of the things I noted in my review was that uh, when you started up the admin control panel, it would actually generate errors if your router didn't support universal plug-and-play, so that way it could program it on, on demand as it needed. And it would continually generate errors on all of the computers in your house because of that. Yeah. Well, another thing uh, Universal Plug and Play does is it allows devices like that to do port forwarding through your router. So okay, the Universal okay. Plug and Play can say, hey, I need this port open to the internet, and then it can ask your router to do that. Okay. Uh, anyway, so a lot of these uh, consumer devices come with the UPnP enabled by default, mm -hmm. uh, and some of these devices even don't have a way to turn it off. Wow. Now that seems a little unreasonable. Yeah, well, some of these devices don't really have a control panel or anything, right? Yeah, they want to be super easy for the consumer. And yeah. who wants to and be... So that's why it's enabled by default, because you, know, you want to just plug it in and have it show up on your PlayStation or whatever, rather than uh, having to go and configure it or something. Well, they don't want to have their tech support guys trying to troubleshoot universal plug-and-play issues. That's like, right. you know, black magic. And, and specifically, you know, it's called plug-and-play because you buy it, you take it home, you plug it in, and you can play it. Yeah. Uh, so if you had to enable a feature, then that wouldn't... It would defeat the purpose, but... Uh, but as with all consumer devices, a large portion of these don't include any way to do updates. So now that we've found these problems, there's no way to actually fix them other than replacing the devices. Hmm. Yeah, I think about all these old devices out there that have ancient firmwares, right? Yep. And no way to update the firmware. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, Alan, if this is one of those issues where if it's not kind of something that the ISPs could solve for the most part for general home consumers, and it, then maybe it just moves it into it. Part of it is that some of the devices that are vulnerable are the ones that your ISP gives you and or mandates that you use. Very true. Right? Like a lot of times your, the, the UPnP router is built into your modem and your ISP says you have to use this one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm tr- actually my, like, uh, my router has, I don't actually, I don't know if I have universal plug and play turned on or off. Right. But I know that uh, you know, it's provided to me by, by Frontier and I know it supports universal plug and play. Yeah, like my modem, I'm lucky I have it. Uh, the my ISP pushes a config to it that um, makes it disable all of the router functionality and just assign an IP address to the first device I plug into it. So what is like? Uh, so what is like the example here? I mean, what, what what's the what's the, what can somebody do with this? Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Here. Oh, but, okay. um, so Rapid Seven, which is the company behind Metasploit and Netexpose and so on. Uh, whose head researcher is H.D. Moore, who we've talked about extensively over the last little while, mostly because of stuff he's been doing with Metasploit. Uh, But he decided to conduct a survey, uh, basically scan the entire internet for five months (laughs) and find uh, how many IP IP addresses answered uh, his UPnP requests. And he found a lot more devices than he expected to find. Oh, really? Yeah. He also uh, found about 10 different vulnerabilities that work against various different devices. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in a second here. Uh, but his survey found 69,000 unique product fingerprints. So a, lo- a lot of the UPnP devices, when you query them, they return like the device and model number and stuff so that you know, right. they show up on your Xbox. You say, you know, I have a, a Boxy Box or a Roku or whatever, right? Uh, so yeah, 6,900 unique products from 1,500 different manufacturers. Jeez. Uh, and these are just ones he found that were internet-facing, not ones that he found you know, that were behind firewalls and so on. So he found 81 million unique IP addresses uh, that re- responded to his queries. Uh, basically, he queried each IP about once a week and you know, just see what he could find. Uh, but basically, 2.2% of the internet... Uh, and 81 million is more IPs than are assigned to the entire country of Canada uh, <laughs> worth of uh, UPnP devices. Uh, the more alarming part is more than 20% of those, so about 17 million of the devices, expose the UPnP SOAP API, mm. which allows you to do a bunch of things with the device. And the other worrying part is 73% of the devices were created using one of the four most popular SDKs. So those four SDKs account for basically three quarters of all the devices that have UPnP. So if you find a bug in one of those four SDKs, you basically have a class break against this huge uh, number of uh, UPnP devices. Of course, right. everybody they wanted to they wanted to quote unquote follow the standard probably. Well, in a not sense. so much that is is most of these manufacturers are they're like well why program our own thing when there's this SDK that just allows us to yeah. start from That's something that already yeah. has it. Of course, yeah. Like the most popular one is Intel's SDK, which has since become open source, but it's based on Intel's original work from like 2001, and there's some problems with it. Although uh, some of the other ones were even worse. Hmm. Um. So Mini UPMPD, which is one of, another open source project, uh, they found 332 unique products that use version 1 or older and are remotely exploitable. Mm. Uh, you know, UPMPD is now, or uh, Mini UPMPD is up to like version 1.6 or something now. Okay. Uh, but a lot of these devices are based on the old version. 1.0 looks like the majority of them. Well, it, in the part of the thing that caused that is some of these devices are based on like beta and release candidate versions that didn't necessarily have a version number so they report as 1.0 so because you know some of these devices that claim to be 1.0 are older than version 1.0 of the the software right so that means there's devices out there that are still running the beta which you know they obviously know there are bugs that they've fixed yeah and 69% of all the devices using mini UPnPD are using version 1 or older, uh, even though uh, version 1 came out in like 2006 or something. 
God, that's so frustrating. And it's it's like just not going to change either unless these devices right. just start well, dying off. Also, part of it, I think, is, you know, a company makes version one of their product and they base it on, you know, this version of the library. When they make the next version of their product, they don't go and re-import the newest version of uh, mini UPnPD. They just you use what they were already using. Well, and you look at like, uh, I mean, you don't want to make too many drastic changes either because if you put something out there and you say, oh, well, this works with the PlayStation 3 or this works with the Xbox 360 and they, you know, because they both those devices use UNP, universal plug and play to, yeah. to, to, do their, to do their online business. Yeah. And if you released a router that quit working with those devices, nobody would buy your router. So if you have something right. that's working in, and it's kind of this weird black magic network technology you don't understand much about, the natural... Yeah decision would be to just keep implementing what you already know works yeah even if it's flawed i guess yeah um and then 23 million devices use uh, a vulnerable version of lib upmp which is the the one that was originally intel and went open source yeah, yeah. uh you know they've had a fix for that for a while but a lot of 23 million devices use an older version still and so those ones can be exploited and allow remote code execution. So you can run whatever code you want uh, on these devices. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if somebody could make a, a system that would exploit the device to install new firmware. Oh, interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be funny. That would be good. Yeah. Uh, so UPnP is a 12-plus-year-old protocol, and it's, it's had its own its security problems since the beginning. Uh, <laughs> The standard contains a bunch of stuff for authentication, but most device manufacturers don't implement it because, <laughs> you know, people don't want to have to make their, their NAS uh, authenticate to their PlayStation <laughs> to be able to play a video or something, right? Right. <laughs> and so it seems to be this trade-off between usability and security, uh, which is fine, but you want to make sure these devices aren't exposed to the internet. And, but yeah, the main issue seems to be that many of the manufacturers are using older versions of the SDK, not updating to the newer version of the SDK when they switch, um, when they do the next version of their device. Yeah, like so, when they rev out the new version with the new LED yeah. lights on the front and the like, gaming extreme added to the name. Yeah, uh, and also that they're not including any kind of update mechanism. So when they do find problems like this, there's no way to fix them. So, yeah. Uh, wow. the, the PDF uh, talks about, you know, what you should do as a consumer. It's like log into the device and disable UPnP if you can. Yeah. Uh, if you can't, you're pretty much stuck with replacing it or using a firewall to make sure it's not talking to the internet. There's already Metasploit modules. Yep. As well, well as a Windows it, utility called Scan Now Universal Plug and Play. Yes. So HDMore has made a tool you can use to check your devices at home to make sure they're not vulnerable. Uh, so that, or you can, you know. Go in there, disable UMP, PMP, and then make sure that it's, it's you know, solved your problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's probably um, not a bad idea. HD Moore also commented that, you know, when he went to file the CVEs, the um, vulnerability disclosure database information about these things that he found, yeah. he didn't find any previous CVEs mentioning any of the UPnP SDKs. <sighs> So either no one's done, no, no one has looked? audited these at all before, uh, or a vulnerabilities have been found in the past, but they've been attributed to like individual devices. You know, somebody found a problem with their D-Link BoxyBox or whatever, uh, and reported that as a problem with BoxyBox when the problem actually lies in the SDK and actually affected you know ten th or uh, a thousand different devices rather than just. Uh, well, on, on, page, on page 17 of the report, this jumped out at me. Uh, he's talking about exploitability of one of these, of CVE 2012-5958. Uh, what makes these vulnerabilities particularly bad is in the context in which the code is called. An attacker can send a single, potentially spoofed UDP packet to the internet IP address of a system running this code and corrupt the entire program stack. The library limits input to approximately 2,500 2, bytes, providing ample room to include malicious code. A single UDP packet... And like you said, because it's UDP, it can be spoofed. So even if there was a firewall that said, you know, only allow from the IP addresses in like the 192.168 range, um, that wouldn't necessarily stop it because you could, you know, if you have a proper firewall that'd be like, hey, that's an internal IP coming from the external interface that's spoofed, I'm going to block it. But, you know, sometimes you'd not have that. Wow. 
So what are you going to do? I mean, you have a new router right now because you're at the new place. Are you worried about this? Are you going to turn off Universal Plug and Play on it? Universal Plug and Play is disabled on my little Netgear wireless router. Oh, okay. Uh, it's not new. I've had it forever. I use it as the access oh, point. Oh, I thought it's, you got a new one. No. Uh, so it's, it's my access point for wireless. Yeah. And I normally have all the router functionality disabled, and it all goes through the FreeBSD box. But I haven't... I haven't wired up enough Ethernet jacks in my house yet <laughs> to hook all that up, so I'm using it as my router. I got you. Uh, but it's only 100 megabit, so I'm not able to get the full 100 megabits on my uh, internet connection yet. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the wireless is only G. It's not uh, N. Oh, you're roughing it in the new place. It's like you're almost camping. Well, I, I'm, I don't use wireless for anything if I can avoid it anyway. <laughs> yeah. There's, I have Ethernet jacks. In all the bedrooms, two in this computer room here, which is my, my home office. I call it the computer room to separate it from the office. Yeah, and then downstairs in the office, there are four Ethernet jacks along the wall. And then there's another one in the basement router, or sorry, basement bedroom. Uh, and then in the wiring closet where my laundry machines are and my electrical panel, there's now a shelf and 11 Ethernet cables come out of the wall from all over the house <laughs> and go into a punch-down block. Awesome. I'll have pictures of this when I'm finished hooking it all up. And uh, you'll be, you're going to like, over time, if people are watching, you're going to be adding stuff to the background there. Yes, and, I'm going uh, I, I'm to put up uh, probably my world map poster and some other stuff back up on the wall here. Uh, people in the chat room were asking about the CRT. The, the rack with the CRT in it is in the basement office. I'll show you pictures of what it looks like <laughs> when it's more set up, but it won't be in this room anymore. There's oh, not enough room. You're going to miss the CRT. <laughs> um. It's funny, the rack barely fits in the basement. Oh, it's, really? It's like seven feet tall because it's 42U, plus it has caster, like, you know, big casters on it. So it's, it's within you know, the width of your hand of the ceiling. Um, and, uh, we, had, we had to lay it over to get it under the bulkhead. <laughs> and just in case anybody has complaints, because it does, there's like a little more like, I don't know, like it's just a little, it's not quite echoey, but it just sounds a little different. As Alan adds stuff to the room, that'll change. So yes. that'll be like a... Yeah, yeah. The, the problem right now is that, uh, yeah, the walls like, are hard. You're the only thing in there. Yes. <laughs> you're it. You're the sound absorption. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, should we take a break and uh, thank our sponsor this week? Yep. All right. GoDaddy.com is, you know, longtime sponsor of the TechSnap program, and uh, they always have some good offers for us. Now, unfortunately, you know, they were ending the uh, 295 offer. It's a, you know, it's a limited time run. However... However, they have gotten such tremendous response from you guys, and thank you for supporting the show by using these codes. They're extending it, if you can believe this, until March 1st. We're getting for it extended. The, the, the uh, Tech 295. Oh, awesome. I know. I know. So we're going to have the uh, $2.95.com until uh, March 1st. And uh, so use that up now while you've got it, because they're, they're really, I mean, there's no way they're making any money on these. So they're not going to run them forever, you guys. So seriously, take advantage of these while they're still doing them. And on top of that, if you've got some renewals, I, I, I have so many domain names, it is ridiculous. I have more renewals in a little bit, and uh, they have a new code where you can save even more money on something besides the .com, hosting, anything you want to do over at GoDaddy. If you just want to take some money off the entire order, they've brought our 20% code up to a 28% off code. So if you want to save 20 per, 28% when you check off, at, check out, at, you know, when you're just over at GoDaddy checking off, you know, like I do. I like to check off over at GoDaddy.com. When you're over at GoDaddy.com checking out, use our code GO28OFF2. GO28OFF2 for 28%. GO28OFF2 when you check out to get 28% off your order. Or if you're getting yourself a .com, do the smart thing and use the code TECH295 and get your .com for $2.95. You can get up to three of those bad boys. Afterwards, they go up to like $7.99. That's still a great deal. That's... A great deal. So you could, great deal. But if you're doing something else, like getting yourself a dot .tv, then use the Go28 off too. And uh, thank you to GoDaddy for the longtime sponsorship of the TechSnap program. Alan, they've got some new stuff they're working on I'm going to take a peek at. But uh, I, I just, one quick plug aside, I maintain one of the things I love the most about GoDaddy is uh, I have a client right now who I work with where they have an IT guy on site. And he's super savvy. He's a longtime Red Hat user. 
He's, you know, he, he's very familiar with all technology through and through. So when we wanted to try something for the client to, you know, try doing like a little, uh, sorry, our site's down right now type temporary site, being yep. able to go into GoDaddy, setting all that stuff up, and then just giving him the login, we made an account for them. He knew how to do everything because everybody in the industry knows how to use GoDaddy's tools. It is yep. the gold standard. And that's why I love using GoDaddy because it makes me more productive when I'm working with my clients. And with codes like Tech295 and Go28 off to it's never been a better time to shop at GoDaddy and support the TechSnap program. And just visiting those links in our show notes lets GoDaddy know that you're watching these ads and that you appreciate them supporting the TechSnap program. All right, Alan, now that we've gotten that all done, should we move on to our next news story? Sure. All right, what do we got? Uh, the New York Times was hacked by Chinese hackers. <laughs> oh, is this for real? I mean, this is really yes. something. Tell me about uh, this. So the New York Times reports that uh, for the last four months, it's been under constant attack uh, by Chinese hackers. Uh, they were using custom uh, advanced persistent threat malware, and uh, they managed to steal the passwords for a number of reporters and other employees of the newspaper. So they started out you know, uh, compromising some emails and so on, and then uh, they went on from there. So. <laughs> Uh, the attacks apparently started after the Times posted an investigation uh, where it found that uh, relatives of the Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, had been amassing uh, a fortune through a number of different business dealings and they had basically over a billion dollars now. Whoa. You know, in a country that's uh, where a lot of people are very poor, when the politicians' families have billions of dollars, it's kind of, you know, unsettling. Hmm. Uh, so the Chinese attackers routed their attacks through computers they had compromised at uh, a few U.S. universities in an attempt to mask the source of their attack. Right? Uh, because you know, it would be fairly easy, for example, the, uh, for internal systems at the New York Times to say, let's just block access from, you know, if, if it's a Chinese IP, maybe we don't want to let it in, except for certain exclusions where we allow you know, the, our reporters from China to come in or whatever. Uh, but by routing it through U.S. IP addresses, it makes it look a lot less suspicious. Hmm. And that also seems like a convenient way to blame it on the Chinese, but not have all the proof to blame it on the Chinese. To me, apparently, yes. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying it yes. is that. I'm not. Right. I don't I, mean to say that. But they're not claiming it's the Chinese government attacking them. They're just claiming that. It's consistent with other attacks that originated in China. So okay, okay, and and also they were they weren't they like trying to access some information about like you were mentioning that Chinese. I mean, there's certain yes, things that basically yeah. specifically targeting the that bureau chief of uh, for the Times in China and uh, the guy that had the job before him who now works in India. Mm -hmm. Those were the first two email addresses to be compromised. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, you know they had the chance to you know do things like they could have basically crippled the New York Times' operation entirely, and they never did. Right. They specifically after... Information. They were, I think, mostly trying to find out who gave the Times information uh, that they used to, for these investigations. Right? They're trying to find sources. Uh, so investigators were not able to determine how the attackers initially broke into the New York Times systems, uh, but they suspect it was a spear phishing attack. Right? You send email to specific people and compromise them. Hmm. and so on and then you know once they compromise an individual machine they can island hop on from there and so on and so forth I'm reading through the article right now and uh, the, of course the, you know, the New York Times is going to report the hell out of this because it happened to them I, yeah. I don't know why it's just something to me doesn't click I guess it's because I just haven't read it, the whole thing yet but yeah it's it, quite it's, a long article it I seems think. like it seems. It just seems. Uh, it seems like it's always either China or Iran these days. It's. It's, it's never. Never anybody well, else. We. We just spent all last week talking about how it was the Russians. Well, that's true. That's true. We did give Russians some love. Well, that's yeah. good. All right. Okay. We're back to China yeah. now. That's good. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so the investigators identified forty-five unique pieces of malware, uh, all of which appear to be custom designed uh, specifically for this attack, uh, and. Of the 45, only one was ever detected by the Symantec antivirus system that the Times uses. Ouch. Although there was a, a counter article at Symantec about how it wasn't their fault or something like that. Yeah, I bet. It was a bit snippy by the sound of it. Um, yeah, it's a totally a black eye for them. Well, 
you know, if the if it's custom written malware that was only ever written to be used against the Times, then well, you know, yeah, you can't exactly going to have a fingerprint for that. That's very true. I mean, but the, see, this is the this is the problem that Symantec has, and the companies like them is they're trying to sell not just based on signature recognition, but on you know this whole platform protection where they secure you from all kinds of attacks, and you know, they, it's they're trying to they're trying to promise something that technologically they just can't really deliver. Yeah. Sorry, the chat room is distracting both Alan and I today. Yes. Chat room, you know what? If somebody got banned, just let it go for now, okay? We'll deal with them the next segment break. Please stop PMing Alan and I, because both of us are getting distracted from doing the actual show. Uh, I, I can't help yeah. it. They're just keep messaging so, us. Uh, security experts found uh, evidence that the hackers stole the corporate passwords for every Times employee. They basically compromised the Windows domain controller and stole the hashes and then ran rainbow tables and so on against them. <laughs> of course. Uh, and that they gained access to the PCs of 53 different employees uh, and go on from there. Uh, the official Chinese response was, quote, China, uh, Chinese law prohibits any actions, including hacking, that damages internet security. Uh, which is kind of interesting because the phrase damages internet security is sufficiently vague that it could mean pretty much anything. Yeah, no kidding. You know, does having a weak password damage internet security? Kind of. So are you guilty in China because if of using a bad password? <laughs> oh, man. Or at the same time, you could go the other way. It's like, is uh, vulnerability research, is writing up a disclosure and having a proof of concept for Java or something, say, you know, is that reducing internet security? Hmm. And so on from there. Uh, and technically, targeted attacks against the New York Times do not necessarily damage the security of the internet. No, no, definitely not. So, you know, it's, it's typical politospeak that doesn't actually mean anything. Well, this is what I would... See, this is maybe why I'm the most skeptical of this, because the New York Times is such a large ta a target, and cyber... Yes. So... Well, the, it's weird. The New York Times... They, their blog has a very good reputation for like technical stuff. Like they have the long series they did about okay. how they use varnish to accelerate their web pages. Oh, so okay, on. that's cool. And they have all kinds of technical detail, and it's really good. But because this is a regular news story, a lot of the technical detail about what actually happened is kind of it's very vague, whitewashed in a sense. Yeah, and they don't like you know. So last week, uh, Hillary Clinton was testifying on on Wednesday, and she said the biggest threat into our nation is cyber. Then John Kerry, this week, was doing his final testimonies, and he said cyber is a huge threat. And then we have another testimony today, and they say cyber is a huge threat. And then, and this is all in the last two weeks, and then this happens, and it's the New York Times. It just seems so, yeah. like, see, we told you, cyber. It's, oh, oh, oh. like, it happened, I'm sure. Well, in this but case, companies the have their Times email is... accessed all the time. Yeah. I mean, this and is... In this case, the New York Times is, is trying to say, you know, well, while we were attacked and so on, they didn't, you know, cause any real harm. Yeah. They read some emails and stuff they should never whatever, but they didn't find uh, the name of the sources or anything. Yeah. I don't know. I don't mean to be so skeptical about it, but... Uh, and, no, you know, it's that skeptical. It's just... I think what it is yeah, is until I see real technical details, to me it all sounds just like kind of Hollywood a little bit. Like you're kind of... It's like more... Well, no, it's, it's, it's you know, the exact type of stuff we've been talking about, you know? Spear phishing to get into one computer, you hop on from there, and yeah, you, no, you infect, and then you hit the domain controller and steal the password hashes. It's very similar to the to the, Rose, I, the I Red October attack. We and I, about, I mean, it sounds is, completely plausible. I'm not saying that. But the part I don't like about it is how it kind of will be morphed into this. Oh my right. God! The you know the symbol of journalism has been attacked. When really all it takes is. Any ordinary misconfiguration or any, any yeah. ordinary bad security well, in this practice. Case, one secretary opening a PDF file. She yeah, should. and it's not a statement on the on the state of the national cybersecurity preparedness or anything like that. But that's that's what it turns into, and it just drives me so crazy. Sorry, and then you know, you guys, you guys up in Canada, you don't have to worry about it. You guys don't have. We would we do? No, you guys, you guys don't care about cyber, attacked. right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, anyways, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to derail on my crankiness about it. Uh, and then the other thing I have is this is not the first attack against the U.S. media that it appears to have come uh, in response to the media's uh, unfavorable reporting about the Chinese government. Uh, Bloomberg News reported that it was attacked in a similar fashion back in June after it posted an article about relatives of 
Xi Jinping, who was the vice president, is now the general secretary of the Communist Party, and in March of 2013 is expected to become president of China. Well, and when we post, when when we when now, they post bad things thing, about, they claim that they've never that that nobody ever compromised anything, that there was attack, but they never got anything. Okay, you know, and that's kind of more the line that people expected to hear from the New York Times it was like, oh, we were attacked, but they didn't get in, right? Or you know, to cover it up. And it uh, the interesting thing was how the New York Times was letting on that they actually got compromised and, and going giving us a little bit of detail. Yeah, that and I well, do like, like that, the, although they were compromised starting four months ago. Yeah. Well, and they go on to have a, how part of what the, the reason they, they didn't report on it right away was they wanted, rather than fix the machines they knew were vulnerable or that had been compromised and then... They wanted to watch them? They, well, uh, they, because of attacks that happened against the U.S. Department of Commerce before, they fixed all their machines or whatever, and then found that the attackers were still getting in through a printer that had been compromised <laughs> on the firmware <laughs> and a SCADA system that controlled the thermostats in the building. My favorite island hop is the one that involves a printer. That's always... Or the thermostat. Come on, that's a great island hop. Thermostat is ultimate yeah. nerd points. I mean, that's more nerd points <laughs> than the printer. Bouncing off the SCADA system in the thermostat to get break into the network. Yeah. Uh, so basically, they wanted to let it go on for a while so they could find every way the hackers were getting in and close them all at once. Uh-huh. I don't believe that either. Well, it, it seems they hired this security firm that seems to specialize in blaming China for things. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Oh, well, that, that makes some sense. I mean, okay, seriously, if hackers get into your network, I totally get, like, the cool tech jerk-off idea of let's watch the hackers and monitor what they do. In yeah. reality, corporations freak the S out, and they lock everything down. Yeah. I mean, they immediately... I mean, I, okay, maybe, this, maybe that happened. I mean, I would want to do it. I would, I, would, I would want to do that. And maybe for reporting purposes, you would. Well, and, and Yeah, partly maybe that's why the Times did it. But also, in their case, they're like, if we just try to close them down, we might miss something. If we watch for a while, we'll find all the ways in and out, and we can close but, them all. But, Alan, that's why the good Lord invented logs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't yeah, need... <laughs> well, you can't log everything, though. No, I suppose not. Like, the amount of storage it would take to log every packet going in and out of a... a yeah. You know, how my internet at home to log all those packets, I would fill up my ZFS array in a couple of days. I just think, I, I just think that's a pretty bold move. I, I, you know what? I choose to believe it's true. Yeah. I think it. I think um, it'd be it'd be an interesting experiment, and you know, and yeah. to pull it off so the hackers I mean, honestly, didn't know you were watching. What I would them. like is to see the actual report from the consulting agency that the New York Times gets in the end. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. the real nitty gritty. Yeah. Uh, now, usually, we only get something like that is if it was the government that was compromised, and you know, because they had to pay for it, they have to make the report publicly available. Or if it's a, a security company itself, and they always like, well, here we'll tell you what happened, so that way you yeah. can learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we probably always just get the sort of, uh, sort of more generic version of what actually happened. Yeah, well, you know, I would be really curious if to hear how they was much much bigger. We could actually have reporters and try to get this stuff, but dude, maybe one day, maybe one maybe. day, I'd be curious to know how they monitor them. Like, and you know, because yeah. sometimes what, what, just the act of monitoring well, somebody alerts uh, you to the. It's it's in the story, but originally, uh, it was the New York Times asked AT and T their ISP. To keep an eye on things. And eventually, when it got over the heads of AT&T, they called in these consultants. So they'd ask AT&T. This is interesting. Remember, uh, but then well, they wouldn't be able to monitor anything in their network if they're having AT&T watch it. Well, so they wouldn't be able to I, see what the hackers I, are getting they to. They could AT&T as like a network. Prov- like, yeah, I think AT&T maybe they do. even their internal network. Yeah, they offer that. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, because if you remember a couple of weeks ago, that one about the guy that was outsourcing his job to China. Yeah. Remember, he got caught by, not by the internal IT guys. Right. But by Verizon. Verizon. The yeah. ISP. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those ISPs, those ISPs are really what you got to watch. Well, you know, everything case, you do. Was, in this case, it was uh, because they provided managed VPN. Yeah. Them. Yeah, yeah, yep. <clears throat> That's why. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. All right. Well, I'm not, all right. Well, uh, I f- I think we'll probably find a little more as this goes. Uh, um, in fact, you know what? I, there was an interesting BuzzFeed has an interesting uh, just quick uh, 
quick, like they have a screen grab here of like the little FedEx email that she got that, uh, that, uh, he or she clicked on. And I mean, they have some interesting stuff in there. So I'll, I'll include a link to that in the show notes too. Oh, I get, I get fake things like that all the time. Yeah. Uh, from like generic courier company and FedEx. It just takes one person to click it. Yep. And if you haven't got a bunch of the UPS ones in the past to know what they should look like. Yeah. It's harder to tell that it's fake. Yeah. Or I got fake eBay ones saying that I'd, I had won an auction or that something I put up with had sold. Oh. Yeah, I think it was something I had put up had sold. You made so some money. Click to, here. Yeah, click here to get your money. Yeah. And stuff. So I had to forward it to spoofs at uh, ebay.com, and they were like, thank you. I'll tell you what I do. And, and this is – now, This here's a little pro tip. Here's a little pro tip for you uh, viewers at home. In your email there, they always give you – now, see, unless it's not legit, they'll give you the tracking number in the email before you click it. And instead of clicking their little JavaScripty HTML tracky link, just copy the tracking number and paste it right into Google search. And Google will uh, give you the shipping, the shipping info. Yep. So you do that for UPS or FedEx. So pfft, there you go. Don't, don't click on it. Don't click on random emails. Don't do that. All right, Alan, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no. Okay. All right. All right. That's, okay. that's the end of the news for now. All right. That's all the news, and that means, you know what? It's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of our website. Now, our first batch of emails will actually come from the subreddit, not so much emails. So you can also start a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv, which is always a great place to go because then in between shows, the other community members can comment on your question as well. Now, Alan, before we get to the first email, I just want to remind folks they can support this, this show and the other shows on the network by shopping over at our sponsors. We're just going to say this segment of TechSnap is sponsored by everyone out there who uses our affiliate link. So thank you for sponsoring this segment of the TechSnap program, you fine, fine audience members. We have links down there for Amazon and Netflix and Newegg and ThinkGeek, but go grab our browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. Then it takes it for you yes, automatically. Yes, because like when I had to wire my house, I used the Monoprice uh, right on. link to right. buy the face plates and Keystone Jacks and Punch Down Block and right. so on. Monoprice and then, is only in the extension. Yeah. And then turns out that uh, I only bought enough to do upstairs, and the electricians uh, <laughs> gave me a box of face plates and, and Keystone Jacks. Uh, but they actually were Minicom Jacks, not Keystone Jacks, so I need a different tool. So I went on Amazon and bought the tool for $5. Oh, so I'm making money on both ends of the deal. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I did all my Christmas shopping at ThinkGeek with the affiliate code and Thank so you, on sir. and so on. And, Thank you. you know, it doesn't cost me anything extra. So, yeah. And I think we're actually getting, like, the next, in the next couple of days, our Christmas shopping payment, which will actually be when my wife and I have, like, a couple hundred dollars to spend to get each other something a Christmas gift. I don't know what. Because now, like, at this point, it's like, well, what's the point? We might as well just save the money because we need the money. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Alan, I'm going to get to uh, the first question that was submitted in the subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And uh, I loved this question. He's looking, this is uh, Monarchy. He's looking for a tool to find network bottlenecks. He says, uh, the network at my office is not exactly in the best of conditions. If you want to just surf around the web or check your email, it's, it'll suffice. But every download over a couple of megabytes usually times out. I found that if I throttle the download, you know, pause, start, repeat, it downloads very quick, fairly quickly. But this is such a pain. I'm sure such a tool has been discussed on TechSnap before, so if anybody remembers what it was or another tool of choice for finding out what's slowing down my network, please let me know. What do you think, Alan? Yeah, there's a couple of things there. A, ne- a download just timing out would mean there's some kind of stall happening. Yeah. So the packets are going fine and then they're not. And that's different. Maybe somebody's hacking his Barracuda firewall. <laughs> <laughs> Loco host. Uh, that was Loco host joke yeah. in the chat room. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's either congestion... Or I wonder if he's on wireless. If he's on wireless yep. and maybe there's a lot of other wireless machines or there's interference, that could be causing that, be cutting it in and out, kind of. Yep. Um, otherwise, it also sounds like it could be a firewall that's kind of just being a piece of crap. Also, I was almost wondering if it was uh, throttling of some kind. But yep. either way, it sounds like he needs to do some diagnosis, some troubleshooting. Yeah. Now, we both uh, have... There's a, there's a couple of tools yeah. uh, to look at there. Like uh, Specifically, like you were saying, if it's congestion or something, if you put something like NTOP, which is basically like the top you're used to on Linux or BSD, but for your network. Yeah. Oh, uh, I love it. It's very useful for seeing where the traffic is coming from and going to. And basically analyze it in aggregate and figure out, all right, a lot of my bandwidth is going 
over this port or for this application or, or this, this host. host. Yeah. And is that what is it supposed to be doing that or not? I've used this. I've gone into networks, and first of all, it produces a beautiful graphical web page. Uh, yeah. That just gives you pie charts and bar graphs. And I've gone into a network and said, hey, did you realize you have IPX still running? And, you know, all of your printers are broadcasting IPX for no reason. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just small little tweaks because it tells you, it breaks it down by protocol. It tells you, you know, this host is consuming 20% of your overall bandwidth when talking to this host. The best yep. way to usually do this is like if you have a switch that supports mirrored, uh, you know, yep. like if you can mirror all of the ports it's, into yeah, one. Yeah, you say all the traffic from... All these ports, put it out this port, and you can run it on a laptop then, or a yeah, server. Yeah, and stick the end top machine into that port so it's seeing yep. everybody's traffic. Or on uh, your firewall, if, like a PFSense yep. box. Yeah, if you have PFSense, you can run end top right on top of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, another tool that the in chat room they're talking about, but I put the link in about 60 seconds ago, is IFTOP. If if top. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's uh, completely text based, but uh, so it's for the console, but it allows you to just see the traffic between IP pairs back and forth, or you can say only show the source or only show the destination, or whether or not to break it down by port numbers or just by IP pairs and so on. Yeah, think of that one. Uh, I use that. Top. Yeah, uh, so I use that extensively uh, to figure out where traffic is going for the CDN and stuff. Like when I'm on the origin server, oh, yeah. I uh, I check and be like, oh, I can see that. You know, server because I turned DNS on. It's, oh, the server in Germany is pulling up, you know, fifty or sixty megabits right now because it's it's copying some, uh, you know, or you know, the origin server for the TechSnap episodes is pulling really hard on Thursday night because people are downloading the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. dang right they are, Alan. Yeah, uh, and so that would be that's the thing I like about that one is you could just do that through an SSH session really easily. Yeah, whereas exactly. Ntop kind of needs a machine that yeah. can just do it for a while. Yeah, and it, it, it it's NTOP is more for when you want to check, you know, analyze over an entire day. Yeah. If tops when you want to analyze over a couple of minutes. I've actually just had places where I just leave NTOP running all the time. So that way if yeah. somebody says, gosh, you know, the network was really slow earlier today. Can you tell me what was going on? I actually yeah. can with NTOP. Exactly. Because I have a snapshot it, of yeah, time. It, it gives you detail over time, whereas yeah. if top is more like I need to know what's happening right this now. second. Yep, that's cool. So, so that's why your toolbox will probably have both of those in it. All right. Now we have a couple uh, other Now, ones. if you actually want to do testing of what's going on, uh, there's MTR, which is Matt's traceroute. It's basically like the typical traceroute command, except for it does the whole thing every second. So it's like a continuous ping mixed with the traceroute. Oh. So you get a display of the route and then columns, and it's basically pinging every hop along the route constantly. And you can see oh. all of a sudden, oh, there's packet loss here. All of a sudden... The latency at the third hop went up by twenty percent, and then for it stayed there for two minutes and then went back down, and stuff like that. That's really cool. See, I was thinking of something completely different when you said MTR. Yeah. Uh, there's a Windows program called MTR that does like uh, uh, SNMP monitoring to do like bandwidth graphing and stuff like that. Oh uh, no, you're thinking of MRTG. Oh, that's right. I am thinking of MRTG. Yep, but uh, that also might be a good. That's tool. the multi-router traffic graph. Yeah, MRTG might be a good tool too to look at. You could yeah, pull your router. And that's if you want to get detailed over time. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could stick the, use SNMP to monitor the the external interface on your firewall or router or whatever the last thing before your ISP, uh, and figure out exactly how much you're doing back and forth. Bacon flaps in the chat room recommends NetSniff NG as another good tool. Uh, and then the one I recommend uh, for actually, if you want to test the speed inside your network and stuff, is iPerf. iPerf, yep. Internet performance. Yep. Uh, basically, you set up a client and a server. So, uh, you know, I have my, like, one thing I do is when, we, when Scale Engine gets a new server, we need to verify that it can actually upload a gigabit per second because that's our requirement. Mm -hmm. So we use iPerf. And have it talk to one of a couple of our different servers in different locations and see how much bandwidth it can push out at once. Ah, uh, clever. And it can also do multi-threaded. So, you know, we can say, you know, open five connections to this other server and push out as much bandwidth as you can across those five. And then, you know, usually that's enough. And it can do TCP and UDP. Because that can also give you uh, an idea of whether it's packet loss or latency or what that's causing. You know, if you see wildly variable TCP performance or less TCP performance than you think you should, you, you know, it's like, oh, this is only getting, you know, 90 megabits per second. Now I'm going to try sending 100 megabits a second of UDP. Oh, it seems fine. But if I send 110, it breaks down. Um, hmm. And so forth. There you go. 
So, uh, you know, I was using that. For example, I just did one last night. I wanted to see <laughs> how the new setup's working. Well, I, I basically I've moved and I have the same modem here, uh-huh. and I want to make sure I'm still getting the hundred megabits that I pay for. Yeah. Uh, but I've actually found that right now the problem is my router is only 100 megabits, and because it's going in and out on one port, it can only do 50 megabits in each direction, right? Yeah. So I'm topping out at 50 megabits. So when I ran speed tests, sometimes I would get less than that, and I found that, you know, even with TCP, I was maxing out at about 40. So I started doing the test with UDP, and I just kept incrementing it up, and it would be fine at 40, 45, 50 was okay. As soon as I went to 55, all of a sudden I would start getting a lot of packet loss, like 10%, right? And it means only 50 was actually getting through. And as soon as I went to 60, I, my actual performance went down to 40 uh, because of the number of lost packets delaying other packets. That's actually really handy, though, that you were able to just kind of get a really clear picture of that setup. I mean, yeah. the results are not ideal, but instead of so, like... Yeah, and like you know, normally you- iPerf is only going to tell you end-to-end, but if you can, you know, do it... Yeah, and uh, for multi- so you know one client at the very far end, mm-hmm. or w- one server out on the internet, and then test it at various points in your network. Right. As you move deeper, further, and further away from the firewall, until right. you find where the problem is, and that just gives you an idea of wh- where you can concentrate, where you need to look. I like uh, I like that, Alan. That's a I might try that around here because I've got a machine that never seems to be pulling the speed that I want, and iPerf might be a good little tool to troubleshoot that with. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we will have links to all of those tools in the show notes if you want to check some of those out. But a hearty recommendation to all of those. Oh, those are all really awesome ones. Uh, and so uh, maybe that'll help. All right, Alan, ready for the next email? Yep. BD Man, I think he likes Blu-ray. He writes in with a VM file storage question. He says, afternoon, Chris and Alan. I've been listening to your podcast for several years and listened to every episode of TechSnap since its inaugural episode. Well, thank you. Uh, here's my question. Hardware specs aside, I would like some feedback on when and why one may set up a data storage based on the following configurations and with a base setup of two physical servers available for config from scratch. The pros and cons uh, or other setup suggestions are welcome. Here we go. Host machine with multiple VMs, each VM hosting the data for that service, i.e. own cloud, data, subsonic music, videos, data, and so forth. A host machine with multiple VMs, data hosted on a host machine, not within a VM, or a host machine with multiple VM, VMs and data is stored on a second bare metal server set up as a file server. And then here's, here's one more for you. A host machine with multiple VMs, a second bare metal server set up for VMs, one with the VM set up as a file server and a data stored there, or a file server as a VM on the same server. Thanks. And your thoughts or suggestions. So he's trying to figure out, should he have a server and the data server all virtualized? Should he have some stuff on physical, some stuff in VMs? Uh, um, you, ha- you have a strong feeling yeah. here? Uh, if he had three machines, he could have one dedicated to storage and the other two for the VMs. And then that way you could hot fail over. Yeah. So he could probably do that with just two. Yeah. So if he has a second one dedicated to running storage, either NFS or iSCSI or whatever then run all the VMs, so make that, the, if the machines aren't identical, make it the, the lower powered one, have all the disks maybe, uh, and the one with more RAM and stuff have the VMs, and then you could have it set up so that maybe only the important VMs could fail over and run off the storage machine if the first one was down. Yeah. So they might be slower because it's a lower powered machine or whatever, Yeah. but this way you could still have those machines. So basically to do live migrations and, and load balancing and stuff, you would need to have storage that's not specific to the machine the VM runs on. Right. Because, you know, if you have like a 50 gig VM image, you can't live migrate that. But if you have, you know, like two gigs of RAM, you can live migrate that. So one of the things I've done here at my house is uh, I use a FreeNAS mini, so a FreeNAS server, as my centralized storage. And then I have a physical box that sits on my network that runs virtualization. And then I have a bunch of VMs on that. The yep. VM operating system, I kind of consider that to be semi-expendable. So that is on the local server hard drive that runs the VM. Yep. But the data, all of the data, all the videos, anything that like is important, that lives on the centralized storage. And so that way right, I can attach that, that to any VM. Centralized storage server also has like, uh, uh, like ZFS is redundancy in it, yeah. right? Yep, like I have. Yep, multiple exactly. drives or whatever. Yep, I have all of that set in. And so yep. I have protection there. So while it sounds like a single point of failure, I'm able to invest in redundancy. I'm able to invest in high-end equipment and make that a good solid setup. And the nice thing is, is then I can just roll VMs and point them at that as I go. Or I can, re- or I can say, all right, 
So today, right now, I have all my video and music being shared out by an Ubuntu 1210 server. But let's say for episode 100, I give up on Linux and I switch everything over to FreeBSD. I could, at episode, during episode 101, I could roll a FreeBSD server and just NFS mount that centralized yep. storage, and I've got everything right there. I fire up the shares on the FreeBSD box, and Bob's your uncle. All the same content. Yep. Uh, so that's how I would do it. Yeah, and... Uh you know, with your VMs, if the machine that hosts your VM dies, you can just start the VMs up on another machine because it's on that centralized storage. Yeah. Uh, so what you would see in a more enterprising environment is something like that, a centralized storage server, maybe with a replica, mm -hmm. like using ZFS replication or, you know, some Dell proprietary thing or something like that. So that... Or crash that, plan, depending on how much data. I mean, if you're not talking right. terabytes. Well, I'm talking about it has to talking, be live, though. Right? Yeah. Like, so that you all the to, storage yeah. is hitting one server, and then if that server goes down, it fails over to a second server that has a replica of it. Um, and then what you can do is if you have two or more machines that run your virtual machines, if one of them dies, you can move the, the you can restart the virtual machines on one of the other ones. Or you can do load balancing. Say you have 10 VMs in total, you have two machines. So you run five and five, but then you find out six of them don't ever do anything. They're all very lazy. And then the other four are very busy. <laughs> right. You can rearrange them so that there's two busy ones on each of the two machines and then spread out the, the uh, low power ones. Or one of your two machines has more RAM, so it takes all the low power ones and then half of the busy ones and then the other half of the busy ones go on the second machine. And then all of a sudden, one of the ones that's never busy gets busy and you can migrate it over. Oh, yeah, sure. And then you have, uh, you have a little capacity. Yeah. I like you know, you have basically load balancing and, and uh, high availability if you do it right. Um, but you probably don't need that at home. Uh, yeah, maybe not. But yeah, depending on what you're doing, sometimes having the storage local will be faster. Uh, you know, if your network isn't high end. Like yeah, if you're I going, if you're going to have a separate storage <laughs> server, sometimes it's nice to have a dedicated NIC just for accessing the storage, and yeah. then a regular NIC for your other network traffic. And I don't have that here. Right. But it depends what you're doing. And I see one of the ways I reduced traffic to my server was by having the local VM image for the, for the OS. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question? Sure. All right. The next question comes in from Aaron. He loves the show. He's been listening for a little over a year now. He's been building a test environment, and uh, he ran into some problems while trying to stripe, while trying to... Uh, well, basically, I'll get to the gist of it. He wants to know, Alan, how to properly test a drive in FreeBSD for putting it in production. Like, for example, if he had media errors on a drive in Linux, uh, he would try to exercise that drive by maybe, like, doing a dash CC during the makefs command. So that way, it would do a whole uh, sector check of the, you know, surface check. Yep. Is there anything available like that in FreeBSD that he could use? Uh, yes, there's a couple. Um, obviously, th there's uh, universal tools like SmartCTL, where you can talk to the, the log on the hard drive and see if it has detected any errors. Okay. You can make it do its self-test and so on to, to check for things like that. Um, also, if I'm not incorrect, the new FS command in FreeBSD has the ability to recheck sectors as well. Okay. I'm like reading the man page while doing the show here. That's how you do it. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's right. But I think there is an option for that. Uh, it's either in NuFS or FSCK well, or something like that. Okay. So, I, I mean, you can keep looking if you want. I was just going to mention, he also included a link to an Android app that I should almost just save for my app pick for yep. last because it's so cool. It's called ZFS Monitor. It's free. Uh, and uh, it lets you, it's a, just a simple monitoring app to keep you up to date on your ZFS pools. It connects over SSH, so you don't have to open up some weird port or something. And uh, gives you status of your <laughs> of your ZFS pool. How cool is that? I kind of yeah. like that a lot. Uh, you just gotta, you know, whatever server you're connecting, you have to be able to connect to it via SSH over your 3G right. network if you want to do it on the go. Anyways, that's ZFS Monitor in the uh, Google Play Store, and we'll have a link nice. to that in his email in the feedback section. Okay, Alan. Guess what? Surprise, surprise. But yeah, you, know, um, you can if you're gonna put ZFS on it, you uh -huh. could fill the file system and do a scrub and make sure that. It, in a scrub, it'll read back all the data and check the checksums, and so it'll find any spots that uh, where it wrote certain thing, and then when it read it back, it wasn't the same. How do you do that? Uh, it's the Z pool scrub. Okay. Uh, but it only checks the data that's written, so you'd want to like fill the partition, just like dd, DD. dev zero in, as into a file or something. Yeah. Uh, so that it writes out the whole thing, and then scrub to read it back. 
Um, I don't know if you want to go that far, but um, could though. If you're basically if you if, if you're you doing had on ZFS, the bench, yeah. But if you're doing ZFS with redundancy, then you just don't worry if the drive's bad. You put it into production, you run it, and you do your scrub every once in a while. And if it finds something wrong, you can replace the the disk. Like uh, the output of the ZFS or the Z pool uh, status command lists every disk and how many times it's come up with a read error, a write error, or a checksum error. So it's always kind of in real time keeping a track of all that, of course. Yeah. All right, guess what? Uh, I actually had a checksum error on one of the disks the other day. Guess what? ZFS, still sexy then. Still sexy. Yep. S- still it like is. it. I mean, that's why I have a free NAS box. Exactly. Um, in fact, I mean, honestly, a lot of these questions this week and the last week are ZFS questions. And I, I wonder... This is a topic I kind of want to take on the Linux Action Show too. Is I wonder if 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 there isn't a slow trickle away from Linux on data on uh, on file servers because of ZFS. I know you can run ZFS Probably. on Linux. In fact, that's what our next question is about. But I just I wonder because we we are getting so many emails about hey I'm trying FreeBSD and because of ZFS. Yep. I mean we just should we go to the next question because it's, sure. it's all right. Next question. Uh, Mr. Uh, Radatron writes in, he has some ZFS concerns under Linux. He says, I have a home server who's originally running FreeNAS with a ZFS RAID, or I'm sorry, ZFS RAID Z1 pool, but due to a lack of support for DNLA server with good transcoding abilities, yeah, I kind of know what he means there, I decided to try a plain free BSD install to no avail. While importing the ZFS pool was trivial, the port system confused me a little. Then I tried PC BSD, but it was terribly unstable due to a graphics issue. Right now I have a yeah. Right now I have a server running Linux with ZFS with the ZFS pool imported using ZFS on Linux module. While the server now meets all of my requirements and seems to work well, I'm worried about the stability of ZFS on Linux module and the safety of my data. And I use it as data backup for university work. Should I keep plugging away at the FreeBSD solution or move all to Linux and set up with an ext4 or ButterFS file system? Or is my current setup in fact stable enough for my purposes? Side note. I realized as I wrote that above, I've been using Linux exclusively for about four years now. And that's largely thanks to Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well, thanks you, Mr. Radatron, for writing in. So, Alan, what do you think? Should he um, be scared about running ZFS on Linux? I guess it depends Linux? what video card he has uh, for the problem he might have been having with PCBSD or whatever. Uh, the port system is not that confusing once you get used to it. The handbook explains it you got to uh, go to the handbook better. for newbies. But it's a yeah. great handbook. Yes. Um, I would give BSD another try, but um, as far as I know, the ZFS on Linux is fairly stable now. Uh, it's mostly developed by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in the States, and they use it for like scientific stuff. Yeah. So they're, I, I'm pretty sure they're like eating their own dog food. So you know they trust it, but. I, um, I would so he, it's funny because he asked uh, you know should I maybe roll should I just go should I just bite the Linux bullet and maybe roll a butterfs file system and I would actually be more concerned yeah. about using butterfs than I would be about using ZFS under Linux for sure and and I, I actually I actually think ZFS under Linux is getting to be pretty serious now I mean they really yep. they really have some good people working well, and, on this uh, there's some talks on YouTube you can see from various conferences where they had like um, the guy, the head guy from Lawrence Livermore, that's doing the leading the ZFS on Linux project. A guy that leads the ZFS for Mac. The guys from um, Selectra or something—I forget the name of the company. Uh, that is, they do uh, ZFS on FreeBSD, and then they had um, one other guy. Oh, from uh, Lumos. Okay. And they were talking about how the four different projects work together to try to uh, you know, make sure that one doesn't implement something that's going to make it incompatible with the oh, others. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Or like, you know, for example, ZFS traditionally had these version numbers, right? And they would a new version number for every new feature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but now that they're diverging away from Oracle, because Oracle isn't open sourcing the new versions, they don't want to just... You know, they don't want to go past version 28 and make a version 29. That means something different than Oracle's version 29. Yeah, right. So they're staying at version 28, and they made this new feature called Feature Flags, where they just have these flags in your in your Z pool that say, it's been upgraded far enough to understand this feature, or this feature, or this feature. And then as they introduce new ones, then... So it'll be the same progress, uh, process with the Z pool upgrade. It's just instead of a version number change, it'll just be a flag saying... 
this pool now supports this feature. The other thing I like that they're doing is they're making it pretty pretty simple for the major distros. They, they're releasing their own blessed stable and development uh, RPMs and DEBs. They even have an Ubuntu PPA that you can subscribe to. And as they issue new stable releases for ZFS on Linux, you would just get it as part of your Ubuntu package update system. Nice. Um, I, I think at this point, you know, it, I, I don't know if I would put my my name on it, selling it to a client, but I think it's at the point where I would put my data on it. Right. You know, I, I just, I, I would say, if you want to keep playing with BSD, yes, it's fun. Do it yeah. in a VM for a little while, learn it in there, and then when you feel comfortable with the port system, when you feel comfortable setting up Samba, when you feel comfortable doing all that stuff, then deploy it on Metal again. And then see where you're at. Just a warning. If you get used to the port system, you will learn to hate Linux. <laughs> Ouch! Or you'll become an Arch user. I'm not sure. No. No. <laughs> no, no. You know, people just hate it when you dog on Linux. They hate it. You get, I know. Them, you get them all worked saying, up. <laughs> when, when you get used to ports, you will definitely miss it when you go back to Linux. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. You know, um, you know, being able to compile Samba with custom options when you need it is just so much better. Now, uh, let's keep on the ZFS train. So now we're transitioning from a, somebody who's just trying out ZFS to somebody who's, who's really down the path of ZFS, and now they want to get fancy. Uh, this, this one comes from Jim. He says, howdy, gents. Totes love the show. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I have a free BSD computer at home, which I use for backups. The drive and my ZPool are encrypted with uh, Jelly, G-E-L-I. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, good, I like that name. Uh, I can unlock these drives automatically on boot with a key file on the UFS root partition. Obviously, this is a little silly, and I would like the key files on a USB stick, which I can use as a physical key. But I can't fathom how to do it. How can I get, uh, how can I get the USB stick mounted during boot so that Jelly can look for the key files on it? Any pointers, Alan? If it has to be the root file system, then you might have an issue there. I think he's just storing it on the root file system because that's just the other system. Right. Well, it depends how far, like, if you're at the point where you're mounting the encrypted file system in oh. your FS tab, yeah. then you're going to need to have mounted the USB stick first. Uh, one option there is there's a, an option in your FS tab, I think it's called late uh, or delay or something like that. Okay. The man FS tab for the thing, where you can say for your encrypted file systems, you wouldn't mount them until later on. Now, uh, like that waits for things like the network to come up, so that you know you don't try to mount a Samba share before your network is up. Yeah, and things like that. Although, if your whole root file system is on that, then you know you need things like your SSH daemon and all the other services that are going to start would have to be decrypted first. So it depends on your setup. I haven't played with uh, Jelly that much to do encryption on my disk because we don't normally need it. Well, I mean, so I guess it sounds like to Jim is the question is there's a lot of moving parts to it. So you might be a little better ask, asking on the ZFS mailing list or starting a thread in links.techsnap.tv. And maybe somebody in our audience has done this and they can answer Jim's question because I'm being really curious. It might be really useful for laptops too. Um, all yeah. right. Alan, and, yeah, it makes sense to have your encryption keys on a USB stick like yeah. that so that you can yeah. remove it or whatever. And so that it's isolated from the disk that's encrypted. Uh, but right. I don't have any experience with that, so I don't know anything about it. So the next question comes from Brian, and Brian mm -hmm. says, I love the show. It seems like uh, the feedback is all about ZFS, <laughs> which it is. <laughs> I like he spells it out that way to make sure I say Z. Uh, I'm curious about using it as a hosted backend for some Linux and Windows server servers. If I have them accessing the data via Samba or NFS, will they still benefit from copy on write, or do the copy on write commands need to be run in FreeBSD on the host? Thanks for the show. Between Twit and Jupiter Broadcasting, my tech brain couldn't be happier. What do you think, Alan? Does he need to be on FreeBSD to benefit from copy on write? No. Uh, the copy on write happens at the block level when, the f when ZFS talks to the hard drive. So that means that even if you're accessing the files over NFS or Samba, the ZFS is still going to do the copy on write. And you so you'll get the snapshots and everything. And you can even, uh, by setting a setting, you can make the .snap directory appear in a regular directory listing. So you could even expose the snapshots over your Samba or NFS. Right. If people need to be able to, you know, say, oh, I want the version of this file from two weeks ago. Well, and if you think about it, if they're accessing it via Samba or NFS, then they're using the Samba NFS or NFS daemon that is running on the FreeBSD box. So they yes. are. So yeah, the, the stuff is still happening on yeah. ZFS that way. 
All right. The next email, you know, even my media center at my house is same thing, right? It's uh, the media center itself runs Windows, but the ZFS file server is right. FreeBSD. Yeah, just like here, Ubuntu box in front of a ZFS. Uh, Tashar writes in, "Hi guys, listening to the last tech snob about the Barracuda story, and one thing struck me: since Barracuda literally allows ac- root access on their firewall and other appliances." You can use that vulnerability to harden the box. I mean, you've already made the investment of buying the device from the specs. They seem to be decently powerful. I would use this vulnerability to exploit my Barracuda device if I had one and then harden it myself. Remove their shadow files with one of my own. Set up better firewall rules. Set up SE Linux if their kernel supports it. Use Nginx for load balancing and maybe even set up a Debian CentOS inside a Chirrut and have that do all the stuff that the original Barracuda does and launch the truth using the init of the original firmware. This method would specifically better be better for uh, setups with expired support, as they will get even more security without any extra cost. Just a thought. Finding silver lining is in a, as in a dumb shouldn't exist dark cloud from the dumb shouldn't exist dark cloud. Good show, and keep up the work. Thank I you. saw an interesting thing like this uh, on um, Twitter as well. I saw, <laughs> really? <laughs> Michael Dexter was asking... You know, can you just install PFSense or FreeBSD or something on right. one of these Barracudas? Yeah, like, seriously. Possibly, because they run Linux, although I don't know if they're ARM or what. But you might actually be better off selling the old Barracuda on eBay because it's got that brand name and stuff. Oh, yeah. And so sell the, the ridiculously expensive device on eBay and get part of that money back. And hopefully you would get enough. You could just buy a brand new box to run your PFSense on. Totally. That'll be even better. Yeah, that's the way to go. So rather than, you know, working in the confines of this device you paid for, try to sell the damn thing and then just buy a white box that you can run whatever you want on. Now we have a video that, uh, let's be honest, the purpose is it's just a little cable porn, right? I mean, yeah, um, basically this one was, I was searching for a little bit of help with uh, these mini jets. Like the keystones, I figured out how to do easily and was doing them, but the mini ones were different and I was, looking on YouTube for some help on how to wire them. And I came across this video. And oh, I was like, man, oh, that is some yeah. beautiful cable management. Uh, for you yeah. audio listeners, we have a link to the video in the feedback section of the show notes. Oh, man, that must have taken so much time. This is what think, They said uh, they ran 1,320 <laughs> Cat6 cables, uh, dressed and terminated, and in total it took 120 hours. There's one or two possibilities here, the way I see it. Either one, this is like the, the, the head IT guy's like way of me- form of meditation is he just goes and does cabling for a while. Or you get the intern or the new guy, the help desk guy, who just got hired two weeks ago well, to go do this. I right? think the more of this was uh, they're doing a new installation and they had you know a bunch of guys working yeah. for a couple of days just to wire this all yeah. up. Yeah, I'm sure there's, I mean, uh, you know, there's entire companies out there that do just this portion of it. But when you, yeah. gosh, it is so nice when you have a clean data center. I'll yeah. tell you, though, I've and cut that, many of cable if, wire. If or, you look uh, at that, that's the Cat6. I think that might actually be Cat6A cable. You notice how much bigger around it is yeah, than thick. the Ethernet cable you're used to seeing? Yeah. It is sturdy stuff. And it's a hard, it's like to get those bends, to get the cables to s- cooperate is not as easy as with your regular, you know. Most people are used to like stranded Cat5E, which, you know, you can just tie in knots if you want. But this stuff is stout. Yeah, uh, like and and it's not the shielded stuff. I, I, this might actually the stuff they're using might be shielded, especially with that much density. Uh, so then it'll have even more. But like mine's Cat Six A unshielded, and um, you know, just trying to twirl up the excess in the electrical box, <laughs> it's it's difficult. Yeah, uh, I had to cheat. The one downstairs, I, I used my uh, the little cable cutter here, or it's for stripping, to cut the the outer sheath there in a couple of places just to make it bend a little more to get it uh, to put the uh, keystone jack where I wanted it. Alan, that, uh, that video is so awesome. Uh, and if yeah. you listen to it with the sound up, like it's just loud data center fans. Yeah. Uh, I, cool. can, I can promise you that my wiring is not going to be that pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I actually... I, I, you know, I just I think I've become a little bit of a diva. I don't I'm like. Oh, you want me to cable? Oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't like cabling anymore. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, a cabler. it's like call the phone company. They do that yeah. <laughs> for a living. Uh, but uh, there's actually there's a, a recommended video there of a device that it's called a cable comb, and uh, it like does it all nice for you. The cable comb. They didn't give me that recommendation. That does sound cool. 
the cable comb. No, I don't have that one. I don't. It's so weird that we get different. I have. Well, it's because it's Google. They personalized it for what they think I want to. You can tell I'm into politics way too much because all of my suggestions are political in nature. Yeah, mine are all like Big Bang Theory, How to Terminate. Oh, that's uh, funny. Key Star Stones Trek. Minor, and, uh, minor politics and Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you spotted a really good ass slash dot, uh, was it uh, today, actually? Yep. And uh, do you want me to go ahead and read it? Sure. All right. So the guy asked this. He says, I work at a medium-sized university, and we're considering reducing the number of domains used for email addresses, which is now around 350 domains. The goal is to have all 30,000 personal email addresses in a single domain. This will increase the clashes for local part of the address for people with the same first name and last name, which they estimate to be around 1.6%. We are considering several options. One of them is to use username at (coughs) domain.tld. And the other is to use first.last at domain.tld. The first would avoid any conflict in the addresses. Usernames are all unique. But the second is much fancier. Which approach does your organization use? And how are name conflicts solved? Manually or automatically? Oh, yeah. This is always a pain. Yeah. Um, I prefer the first name dot last name to a username, uh, especially at a school where you're going to get people make silly decisions. Um, and then at my school, it was first name dot last name, and then they just auto added numbers at the end when there was collisions. Yeah, because you always wonder, like, how did you end up as like Mark dot Hamilton seventeen? <laughs> I recommend that too. And the other thing is, like, sometimes mainly this is an issue with female employees um, is when they get a name change, some places actually change their username. Which right. is fine, but then you you know I I don't you need I, like I don't. an alias of their old email address pointing right. to the and stuff. I like just that, yeah. usually say, and this is just because I, I I worked at a place once where there was a set of gals who just kept getting their name changed all the time, and so I pushed for a policy of changing the email address but never changing the username. This is back in the NT four days with terminal server roaming profiles. I mean, it was just a right. nightmare every time one of these gals changed their name. But if you did the first name dot last name, it didn't just be a matter of an email alias. But if you have, and you and you wouldn't have to change their username necessarily. But that just kind of right. depends on the policy there. But yeah, I like first name dot last name too. Yep. Uh, and he has some places put a dot, so first name dot last name dot number. Uh, but that's, right. I think that's kind of silly. Um, and then some places will go to like trying to use like a middle initial or something when there's a collision. But then you yep. can end up with a collision anyway. Uh, and you know, especially if you're just using the first initial of the middle name, you end up with a collision anyway, and then what do you do? And then, then yeah. eventually it gets to the point where it's going to require a human to solve it, whereas with the um, just adding a number, uh, you know, incrementing the number at the end, you don't have that problem. All right, Alan, we have a couple of follow-ups to get to, then a Hall of Shame question, and then our announcement for episode 100. Are you ready, sir? Yep. Big show, big show. It's ridiculous. Uh, in response to something you mentioned just kind of offhand during the Barricade Your Barracuda episode last week, you mentioned how sometimes performance can actually be better if your file system is compressed because the CPU can be faster than reading it from disk, and since it has to read less from the disk, it can actually end up in faster throughput. Well, uh, Canalot in the uh, TechSnap subreddit tried it out. So uh, he found that, and here I'll just read it, he says, but when Alan said you could get better speed from using a compressed file, I had to check it out for myself. He says, I have slash temp mounted on a slash tempfs in RAM. So I did this. I CD'd into slash temp and then did a gzip of a 500 megabyte file and then copied it to another file. I got 150 megabytes per second from the gzip test on 100 and, and 110 megabytes per second on the straight copy. So, for, so in, in other words, reading the compressed data, he got 150 megabytes a second. Reading uncompressed, he got 110 megabytes a second. So you're right. Decompression is still faster yeah, than well, reading from a spinning desk. Yeah, it also depends uh, on the data that you're compressing and so and on. The, and the type of compression. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not always faster or anything, but... Yeah, but it was interesting. All right. Uh, so Jacob wrote in. He's had a Hall of Shame question. He said, do you have a consolidated Hall of Shame page that I, that I could get to to reference? Well, Jacob, we do. If you go to our subreddit, it's right there on the side of the uh, TechSnap subreddit. And you can find okay. that. Okay. Now, the chat room has had a chance to vote on this already, Alan. But, uh, oh, and I just want to give a quick mention. We have a Hall of Shame question for you guys. I, I kind of, I want to know where you lean on this. Maybe you and I can just make an executive decision right here, right now. Mm-hmm. Do you think blank 
plain text passwords can qualify someone anymore for the Hall of Shame. Because I feel like our Hall of Shame could be dominated by plain text passwords if we don't kind of curb that. Yeah, because I got one of those today. Yeah, and I got one earlier this week. So we had a submission that got 13 votes uh, for a blank password. I think we're going to kind of end those now. Blank we wanna, you mean plain text passwords? Plain text, yeah. yeah. Well, it could have put, put it almost the same thing. Almost yeah. the same. So uh, maybe we just, <laughs> you know, put as one of the numbers everybody that sends you your password in plain text or something. And yeah. then say that's already in the Hall of Shame. Then, and then, you, you know, know. Have it as one entry instead of as uh, a bunch of different ones. Yeah, yeah. So I think the Hall of Shame should be reserved, you know, for especially bad, unique, large security blunders, big like yep. PlayStation 3 type blunders and stuff like that. Yep. Okay. For episode 100, Al and I have decided we will do a limited time episode 100 t shirt that will only be offered for a few weeks during the run-up to episode 100, assuming we get everything together, and then we'll be quickly discontinued after episode 100. And we just want to do as something to say thank you for you guys, thank you to you guys, and, you know, give you something to sort of celebrate the 100th episode so that, you know, we can celebrate 100, and I think we're going to make 100 weeks in a row without a single yep. interruption. I mean, we're yep. going to do a little dancing and magic to make that happen, but it's well, going to happen. The dancing and magic will be the week after. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, like, ironically, yeah. Uh, so, but we have a question for you. We've come up with a tagline for the shirt, but to be honest, it's not safe for work. Uh, it's, it's, it's the patch your S, only it'll be spelled out. That's a classic line here on the show, and we just want to know if you guys would be comfortable with that. So we're going to give you two options, a T-shirt with the swearing or a T-shirt without the swearing. It'll just have a, a, a silhouette of Alan's face. We, we have a great little logo picked out for it. Um, so you have to go vote. I'm going to vote right now. I'm going to say a shirt where you where it has the swear word on it, which right now, by the way, from the live stream, has a dominant 83% of the votes. 83% of the votes right now are for the shirt with the swearing on it. So we're going to have this. We'll have a link to this poll in the show notes if you guys would like to go vote, and uh, then uh, we'll have it rolled out by episode 100 for you to well before then for you to make a uh, a purchase. So uh, let us know what you think and uh, go vote. And we'll have that link in the show notes. Oh, I, I kind of hope people go for the swear word. The, the disadvantage to the swearing shirt is people might not be comfortable wearing that at work. And wouldn't it be great if people saw your shirt and be like, hey, what is that? And you could be like, this is yep. all about the TechSnap program, brah. So, that, you know, yep. it's a give and take. It's a give and take. All right, Alan. Well, that concludes the feedback for this week's episode. That must mean it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite make it to the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, give you links to follow up on your own and read the whole story later on. And most of these links are provided by our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Allen, are you ready for the first story in the Roundup? Yep. All right, I, I think I tossed this one in there. I'm not sure. Did you toss this? this or? No, it was you. Aaron Swartz pro protesters take over government websites and install asteroids. This made a big hoopla just shortly after last week's tech snap. So mm -hmm. it didn't quite make our regular news cycle, but I still wanted to give it a mention. Uh, the homepage of the U.S. Prob probation office, I guess, yep. uh, for the Eastern District of Michigan has been hacked. And they, they put Niancat on there and they put, a, they put a message on there about, you know, oppressive government. And it was a pretty dramatic scene. Uh, and now it's being handled as an FBI criminal investigation. Yes. All right, next story is yours, Mr. Allen. Yes, uh, so Robert Watson, who's a computer security researcher at, I think it's Cambridge University. Uh, he's also a FreeBSD core team member uh, and part of the security team, and uh, I think he's the head of the re release engineering team. He has a, an ACM paper coming out on mandatory access control mm. and why it's a better solution than SE Linux, and uh, which is a instead of a multi-user access control, it's a, a type-based access control. Hmm. Is a different methodology for thinking about controlling the access. Okay. Uh, he also attributes the success of sandboxing uh, to code that was distributed uh, by FreeBSD after being developed at McAfee uh, with funding from DARPA. Uh, and it, it goes on some of the history of um, how sandboxing came to be. Uh, you know, when it first started in uh, the year 2000 with some DARPA funding and uh, it was a private research firm, and then it got bought by McAfee, and they continued it. And how, you know, just like FreeBSD is the reference implementation for SCTP and IPv6, uh, it's also the reference implementation for some of this access control stuff. 
All right, on the next story in the roundup, a password cracker targets Siemens S7 PLCs. Yes, uh, those are specifically the same one that was in the Iranian centrifuges, Aha. Uh, but are also used in a number of things that aren't related to nuclear weapons. Right, yeah. They're, well, they're, uh, they're, they're just, just a, a controller. That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a programmable logic controller. It can go in anything that needs programmable logic. You got a valve that needs opened? Yeah. There's your boy. This one's just great. I want to just toss in there just for some geek porn. Uh, who got yes. some geek porn this week? The founder of PCBSD houses his servers in his own yard. He builds a server shed in his backyard, and he's blogging about it, and he's including yep. pictures. So Chris Moore, who we've talked about a number of times, and uh, maybe we can get an interview next time there's a release or something. That'd be cool. Uh, or maybe we can interview him about this. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <coughs> That'd be I a might, good way to work maybe, it into I, TechSnap instead of last. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so he needed to house some servers, and he decided that he happened to have uh, a fairly big shed. And... Um, Love it, it also happened that when he had them install power to his shed, he had them install Ethernet. He's like, anytime I'm running cables anywhere, might as well put Ethernet too, right? I love Which this already. Kind of my thought. So even uh, with your shed, yes, his, his shed had Ethernet that wasn't being used, and it has power. So he basically uh, built a room inside the shed, including a roof, so it's completely isolated from the shed, an extra, an extra layer of protection or whatever. Uh, and he put some racks in it and uh, dedicated air conditioning, and he's basically running a mini data center in his shed. <laughs> well, hey, man, when I had my house built, I made sure they put data jacks in the garage, and now we're yeah, able to I, do this very show right now. <laughs> I spent the first half of this week having uh, electricians in here retrofitting uh, That's right. Uh, Ethernet drops all over the house. Uh, all right, next roundup story. This one might just be if you want to go get your creepy on after the show. I'm not sure. Uh, but Paddock put this in the, uh, Paddock put this in the uh, subreddit, and I was really... Pretty pretty alarmed when I saw this. Uh, Trident cams have been publicly expo- exposed due to a firmware bug, I guess. And, uh, you know, these are these cams that you, you hook up to the net, and then you just go to their IP, and you can see them. And I got to tell you, these ones are active. I included a link where you can actually find a couple of them. Some of them, you know, it just you just feel weird even looking at them. Like, one of them is a child's room. Uh, another one is some office building somewhere. Another one's a parking lot. A lot of random stuff. There's even one that's... Uh, uh, like uh, somebody's somebody's living room for some reason. Like, why would that even? Why would you even have that on the net? Like, I I don't. Here's a server room that's yeah. kind of on its side, looking at a rack that's half filled. I with just stuff. I just opened a random one, and it appears to be the generator uh, and the air conditioners at the back of some building. Yeah, you know, you possibly figure so- a data center actually. Somebody put that there, yeah. Like, and here's one that's closed now, but there's a there's one that was like a, a a factory of you know, yeah. So these Trident cams are just all over the web, and uh, like I, I don't know. So if you have one of these things, take a look at this, you guys. Seriously, we you know you never know. Like oh, this is really sad. Like here's a dog. Somebody has a webcam of their dog, and their dog is just sitting out looking out the window, watching for them to come home. <laughs> right. That's what that dog probably that does probably- all day. <laughs> and I didn't need to know that. That's just sad. So, anyways. Uh, just I wanted to, you guys can go read up more about that if you want. All right, on the next roundup story, a vulnerability in JSON parser in Ruby on Rails 3.0 and 3.2. Yes. Uh, You're right. Yeah, this so is the, a big it, roundup. An, another problem with Ruby on Rails, but basically their uh, parser that uh, understands JSON, which is the JavaScript object notation, uh, has a bug in it that could allow authentication bypass, meaning accessing stuff that normally requires a login without logging in, and SQL injection, meaning that you can cause your own string of code to be executed on the SQL server, uh, which could allow you to copy data or delete data from the database. Hmm. Or, for example, overwrite the password hash of a user with one that you happen to know the real password for. And so, you know, if you run Ruby, you should probably update. Yeah, yeah. Next roundup story. Malware poses as a faux Adobe Flash update. That's pretty clever. That's pretty clever. Yep. Yeah, get your Adobe updates. Make sure you get those all those Adobe updates installed. What malware? Where did this come from? Yeah, yeah they did a, an actually a, a fairly good job of uh, making it look exactly like the Adobe Flash download page. <laughs> they have a screenshot in here. And so if it a user does. has ever seen the Adobe thing come up, clicked on it, gone to the Adobe page and it yeah. installed it, if that page just opened itself, they might assume that uh, it was time honestly, for an update. Honestly, if I didn't look at the URL, I mean, it even has the favicon. If I didn't look at the URL, I wouldn't know that. Yep. Huh, that's scary. Now I'll be double checking. All right, now ESET has a blog post 
needs to get all of you real scared. Uh, there is a there is an SSH daemon out there that can steal your passwords. Well, these have been out for a long time, but this is yeah. just a specific instance. Yeah. Uh, mostly because it seems to be more widespread than normal. Oh, uh, people basically, actually, okay. so uh, in some ways, the attackers compromise a server uh, running Linux, and then they replace the regular SSHD ah. with their own custom SSHD. And what that SSHD does is, uh, A, it allows the attacker to log in without needing a username and password. Uh So they just connect, send a certain string, and uh, they get um, root access. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the other thing it does is it logs all the attempts, especially ones that are successful. So because your passwords would be hashed in the password database on your on the compromised server they maybe can't get the admin password or the root password yeah yeah but if they wait until the next time admin or root logs in they can because they own the sshd they can see what the plain text password is and then they know that oh that one worked so now they can access that user or they might be able to for example um, access other servers nearby that happen to have the same admin user this would probably be true for anyone that got on a box and replaced a remote login daemon that accepts usernames and passwords. So they could do like yes. this with FTPD uh, too. Is, yeah, and you know this happens with uh, compromised servers and SSD all the time. Yeah, this particular one is just a little uh, they seem more, well, these. more well done, and this particular one is happening a lot, and it's being used in concert with that exploit for Apache we talked about. That, oh yeah, that uh, you know isn't active while the admins <laughs> logged in over SSH and stuff. Yep. <laughs> That really clever one. Yeah. Huh. All right. <clears throat> Next roundup story? Yep. Attackers exploit Java compromise reporters without borders site. Yes. So the website of uh, reporters without borders was compromised using the Java exploit and then uh, infected with malware as a watering hole attack. So as we talked about before, a watering hole attack is when you target a website specifically of uh, a group of people that you want to exploit. So like when... They're doing a watering hole attack against like the arms industry or aerospace industry. They'll find a, a new site or something that's about that industry where people in the industry are going to go to it a lot because it's like a watering hole uh, for animals. And then they inject the, uh, the malware in there to compromise as many of those people as possible. Imagine so if those... It's like, uh, kind of like if you wanted to... It's poisoning the well if you want to poison all the people. Imagine if those Chinese hackers that were in yeah. the New York Times site had done that. You exactly. Know. And you know, in this case, again... This seems to be targeted at uh, reporters that are reporting uh, pro-Tibetan and so forth. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Surprise, surprise. All right, well, a little bad news for everyone's favorite little media player, VLC. A little yeah. buffer overflow. Yes. Who uses uh, so, ASF anymore, though? Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> there's a, researchers have discovered a buffer overflow in the uh, parser for ASF files, which is yeah. a, an old Microsoft... Uh, movie mm-hmm. format, mm-hmm. Uh, where basically if an attacker made a specially crafted ASF movie and got you to play it, it would, uh, comp- it would could allow remote code execution on your computer, or sorry, v- arbitrary code execution on your computer. VLC the other probably thing is, would be the file, so the application associated with that file, right? Yes, yeah. uh, very likely, yeah. or media player. Um, the other thing is if you might have the VLC browser plugin installed, and so it could oh, attack yeah. you that way. Oh, yeah. Um, the new version, 2.0.6, isn't out yet, or wasn't a couple hours ago anyway. Uh, they plan to have it out very soon. In the meantime, don't open ASF files that you don't know where they came from, or just don't open them at all. <laughs> um, or there's a particular module just for the ASF processing you can just delete from your install to break the processing of ASF files. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you may want to disable the VLC browser plugin if you're using it. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think, yeah. I think there was a place for that VLC, VLC plugin back in the Dizzle, but I'm not so sure if it's still needed. Um, it can be used. Um, but yeah, yeah okay. if, you're, if you're getting updates and it's 2.0.5, well, sure, yeah. it's yeah. still not uh, the new version. Oh, uh, really? This bug is not fixed until 2.0.6, which isn't out yet. <laughs> okay. So if you're seeing an update to 2.0.5, yes, you want that update, but, you're but not done. it's not yeah. fixing this vulnerability okay. yet. 
So do the next one too. Just always do the VLC updates. Why not? I mean, have you ever had a VLC update break anything ever? No, it only ever makes it better. Yeah, seriously. Uh, all right. Well, now I think we're all done here. But before we get out of here, one other topic that we didn't get to this week—it was kind of not really a big deal, but man, did it get blown out of proportion. Was the GitHub outage that happened? Uh, we talked about that and many other things on episode 34 of Coda Radio. If you haven't heard that and you're a little curious about what was going on with the GitHub outage uh, last week, go listen to episode 34. Uh, well, as uh, uh, the outage or just where they disabled the search feature? Oh yeah, you're right. I shouldn't call it an outage. Yeah, they disabled well, the search the search feature. There was some, there was an SS, SSH yes, uh, key. Uh, yeah, I found that a lot of different people uh, were posting yeah. their well, SSH keys away. in their. Uh, you're going to tell them. You're telling them like half the story. Well, they have to go listen because we got we got a little bit on a soapbox. Also, a good conversation, although a little controversial, about PHP and uh, Scale Engine's successful implementation of PHP hosting came up as uh, one of the uh, you know yeah. like look see this is a good implementation of PHP. Well, uh, so. specifically, when you're comparing it to something like Ruby or Python where you basically have to have a completely separate environment for each application, it's, you know, I like PHP better because it doesn't require that. Scales a lot better that way. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's a lot easier to host 100 customers. Yeah. Like, I don't know anybody that hosts 100 Ruby customers that isn't using virtualization to do a, basically a separate machine for each customer. Right. Which is a ton of overhead. So uh, those are some of the things we talked about in episode 34, if you guys want to go check that out. If TechSnap's over and you're jonesing for a little more tech stuff, go look at, listen to that. But uh, all right, Alan, I think that brings us to the end, right? Yes. All right. Well, uh, congrats on the new house, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing stuff show up behind you and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. And uh, go vote on our poll. Let us know if you want a T-shirt that has a little swear word on it or if you want the Safe for Work edition. We'll have the poll linked in the feedback section of our show notes. And then look for the uh, f- official episode 100 limited time shirt announcement which we'll have very soon but uh, all right with that we'll wrap up the show thanks so much everyone for tuning into this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week 